Good evening, everybody. We'll get started. I'm Ellen Beal, president and one of the founders of Saratoga Book Festival. Really excited that you're all going to join us tonight for a night of short story writers, a presentation of Saratoga Book Festival and Saratoga Pride. Uh, we are really looking forward to many Saratoga Pride, Saratoga Book Festival programs in future years. Tonight's presentation is actually the third in a series of three. Um, if you've missed the other two, feel free to find us on YouTube at Saratoga Book Festival, uh, and you'll be able to see the previous two Saratoga Pride, Saratoga Book Festival sessions, as well as a number of other authors that we've had the privilege of speaking to during this long pandemic uh, season uh, that we've been in. So, I am going to get started with some introductions in a second, but while I have you all, just want to go through a few housekeeping items and also introduce you uh, to Saratoga Book Festival if you don't know who we are yet. So on the housekeeping side, um, this is meant to be a, um, a an, certainly an interactive session and in that we welcome your questions. We ask you to put them in chat. Um, one of my colleagues, Christian Purdy, will be monitoring chat and will um, be able to post information as the talks go on, um, interesting links where you can buy uh, books and relevant uh, resources for you. So um, that's a great place to type in your questions and comments. Um, we will be uh, recording this session. You don't have to worry. Um, only the only people who will be seen on the recording are those of us who are speaking. Um, and uh, the recording will be posted on our website, social media, as well as YouTube. So a few words, if you don't mind, about Saratoga Book Festival. Uh, Saratoga Book Festival will be, will be holding our first live literary event this October 15th through 17th in downtown Saratoga Springs. Most of the programs are free and the idea is to have a comprehensive book festival that has uh, fiction, nonfiction, adults, children's and young, young adult. It's our first, so we're starting off as sort of a, a small compact walkable festival in the beautiful town of Saratoga Springs and hope to be here to grow and expand topics and authors in the years ahead. So we hope you'll join us um, in this journey if you have occasion to visit us in Saratoga Springs. And as a matter of fact, if you're not from Saratoga Springs, feel free to type that in the chat too. We'd love to know where you're from. So without further ado, um, I would like to turn things over right now to my friend and colleague, and um, our, our technical wizard behind um, all of our virtual book talks, Steve Rosenblum. Steve is the operations lead um, and one of the original board members of the Saratoga Book Festival. He is also one of the coordinators of Saratoga Pride. Um, he's on the executive committee of the Opera Saratoga Board and has been actively involved in a number of other community organizations. After spending several years as a special education teacher outside Boston, Steve has had a long career at John Hopkins Hancock Financial Services Information Technology Human Resources and Training. In 2014, Steve moved to Saratoga Springs to work as an event and meeting planner for the Maisie Center, a learning technology and innovation think tank. Currently, he's working part-time for Stephens School I'm going to let Steve pronounce that. I am sorry about that. Sclerodema, close enough, um, foundation as a project manager while enjoying his partial retirement. He and his husband, Eric Rudy, who is the general manager of Homemade Theater, um, are striving to make a significant con contribution to the rich fabric of life in Saratoga Springs. And he's been especially pleased to be a part of the team along with CJ Purdy and Kim Vaughn Alkamadi that have curated Saratoga Pride and Reading as part of June's wide array of Pride Month activities. So Steve, I'm gonna hand things over to you and our wonderful authors tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. It's the Scleroderma Foundation. Thank you. Definitely Scleroderma <laughs> Foundation. Thanks. Um, since Cindy Swadba 
wasn't able to log in. She was having some technical difficulties here. I'll say just a, a quick word about Saratoga Pride. Um, this is basically the wrap up of our Pride Month activities. We've had a bunch of activities this month um, from mini golf to uh, um, these book festival items. We've had cocktails and other events. And we started off with our new Pride Crosswalk. Hopefully everybody has had a chance to get downtown and see the Pride Crosswalk uh, in all its glory. It's really an exciting thing to have in Saratoga. So it's been a great Pride Month and I'm very excited to be able to wrap it up with this, which is the final in our series of uh, Pride and Reading talks. So moving along without further ado, let me introduce you to the first of our authors, Michael Lowenthal whose short stories and essays have appeared in the prestigious literary journals Tin House, Plowshares, The Southern Review, Guernica, True Story, and The Kenyan Review, and have been widely anthologized, including in Best New American Voices of, 20, of 2005. Lowenthal's first story collection, Sex with Strangers, was published in March 2021 a fiercely honest exploration of the risks and rewards of contemporary relationships and hookups. Sex with Strangers embraces the dizzying power of attraction across the spectrum of passion and infatuation. Lowenthal is also author of four novels, The Same Embrace, Avoidance, Charity Girl, which was a New York Times book review editor's choice and a Washington Post top fiction of 2007 pick, and The Paternity Test, an Indie Next selection and a Lambda Literary Award finalist. He's also written for the New York Times Magazine, Boston Magazine, The Washington Post, The Boston Globe, Out, and other publications. Before becoming a writer in his own right, Lowenthal was an editor at University Press of New England, where he founded the Hard Scrabble Books imprint, publishing such authors as Chris Bojalian, W.D. Wetherell, and Ernest Hebert. So, He's a former board member of the literary human rights organization, Penn New England, and Michael lives in Boston. So welcome, Michael. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for the introduction, Steve, and thanks for the invitation. I want to thank Ellen as well and um, Purdy for all your good work and exciting to be part of this first um, iteration of the, the Saratoga Festival. It seems like a great thing. Um, I'm, I'm going to read from um, just the beginning of, of the last story in my collection, Sex with Strangers, which has this sexy blue cover. Um, and the story is called The Gift of Travel, and it's um, my attempt to look way back in time, but from a, a point of view um, that's more contemporary. So Wonderful. I'll, go ahead, I'll go ahead and just read those, the beginning of the story. The Gift of Travel. Jim kept saying he wanted to take a last blast trip together. His treat, just the two of us, my first chance to venture beyond New England. He was in hawk to hospitals in Maine and Massachusetts. He'd maxed out his credit cards on smuggled Mexican meds, but he was sitting on 97,000 Delta miles, enough to take us somewhere with a strong restoring sun. He'd hoarded the miles in the past few years before he got too sick to fly hopping from campus to campus with his retrospective lecture, Filthy as Fuck, A Faggot Writer's Life. This was 1993. In the newly rising queer studies programs at Duke, Yale, et al., suddenly it was in to be outrageous. Did Jim truly think the trip was anything but a pipe dream? Think that he could clamber out of his frailness back to passable health and someday might jet away again? Probably not, but Keep in mind his forte was erotica, his plots, like most of their genre, adamantly implausible. Picture it, Ben, he mused one day as I prepared to flush his Hickman catheter. Copacabana at sunset, my wise and worldly cock inside your twinky little bum. Sure, I said, swabbing the lumen's end with alcohol. Sounds delicious, all except the last part. Ouch, he cried. The catheter site was purplish and crepey. Had I stung Jim's skin or his pride? Still so stingy, Ben, he said. Still, when I'm dying? Jesus, don't you want me to die happy? I want for you not to die, I said. But maybe he didn't hear me. 
Tell me this isn't about your pledge to Thomas, he said, St. Thomas, martyr for the cause of monogamy. Thomas was my boyfriend, or had been, for five plus years since we were college freshmen. Nine and a half weeks ago, he'd moved to San Francisco to take a wetlands restoration position at Point Reyes, but really to put a continent between us, a trial separation, while Thomas considered my bid to win him back. No, said Joan. Oh, I see, it's me. Then, Ma, he barked, turning to Betty, who sat in the bedside armchair. Ma, can you believe this kid's cruelty? His mother eyed him over her bifocals. Oh, Jimmy, she said, her voice plump with disapproval, as though he'd asked for a second bowl of pudding. Then this Republican former librarian of Brockton, Massachusetts, this rock-ribbed, churchy-voiced octogenarian widow said, leave him be for heaven's sake, he doesn't want your cock. Betty was right, but the problem wasn't that Jim was dying or what he was dying of. I hadn't wanted him even before the AIDS had gone full blown. Nor was it that he was unalluring. When he was healthy, Jim had had a thrillingly hard handsomeness and even now, eroded to the essence of himself. Even now he sizzled with charisma. Who could resist the scrumptious clash between his courtly looks and his smutty disposition? I could, apparently. Jim had published a story of mine in one of his anthologies, a show of faith in a fresh from college writer. This led to flirty postcards then a phone friendship. He lived in Portland, Maine, I in Boston, and finally to his hiring me as an assistant. I had told him early on when he said he had to fuck me that I thought it was better if we kept our bond professional, except the word I fumbled for was clean. A dirty fag writer and you wanna keep things clean, he'd said, I'm not sure you're even teachable. Whenever I'd mentioned Thomas, Jim would rant about our prudish, thankless generation. This is why we marched and sat in those jail cells, this? for your right to be such boring marrieds? I loved those rants actually. Wowed to sit at the feet of a man who'd lived through, who'd made such big swaths of history. He'd been a hustler, a towel boy at the Continental Baths. In 1970, after the notorious snake pit raid, when one of the men arrested leapt from the precinct's second story, impaling himself on a spiked metal fence, Jim had helped to organize the protest. He had been there, there being a past I longed to touch and also a feeling of life as large and urgent. So why then, why had I resisted? He was my mentor. I wanted him to want me for my writing. Plus, wouldn't our sleeping together have seemed too neatly plotted? The sort of cliche that Jim's own work was sometimes faulted for. But no, those are literary excuses invented later. In truth, at 23, my body smooth and slinky, my hair a potent shock of baby blonde, I simply couldn't fathom sex with any man as old as Jim, even if being sexy was his profession. 46, a year younger than I am now. The Hickman line, delivered Jim's nutrition intravenously and had to be flushed with heparin daily to keep his blood from clotting. I screwed the syringe into the lumen and opened the catheter clamp. Weeks ago when the nurse had trained me, I'd been tense with fear, less of Jim's infected blood than of the chance I'd kill him with an accidental bubble. But now as I firmly pushed the plunger with my thumb, shooting the clear liquid toward his heart, my body throbbed with a proud, awestruck sense of competence. When all the hep was injected and I'd reclamped the catheter, I tried to read Jim's face for signs of nausea, but Jim appeared at ease. In fact, he was snoozing. Lately, he could drop asleep in the middle of a sentence. Beside him, Betty too had seemingly nodded off. I sat there in the gloam of Jim's cloyingly stale apartment, amazed by how unamazed I was. He was the first person with AIDS I'd ever helped to care for. And when I'd started a year ago, I had expected stink and gore and sobs, but sometimes it was only this, a silent, sleepy room. Padding to the trash can with the used syringe and swabs, I was jarred by a ghoulish, hissing voice. 
and it said, sorry? I spun around and there was Jim, devilishly grinning. Sorry, he hissed again, then cackled. You'll be sorry, you never let me fuck you. So I, I will leave it there for now. And um, very excited to hear Joe Aconquo read. Um, I love his book and it's an honor to be sharing this uh, billing with him. So I'm now going to go off camera and listen attentively. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. That was awesome. Wow. All right. Let me introduce Joe Oconquo. So Joe's debut novel, Jazz Moon, won the Publishing Triangle's prestigious Edmund White Award for debut fiction, and he was a finalist for a Lambda Literary Award. His short stories have appeared in Newtown Literary, Global City Review, the Pilt Town Review, the sorry, the Pilt Down Review, the New the New Engagement, Story Cord, Shotgun Honey, Love Stories from Africa, Best Gay Stories of 2015, and Strength. His short story Cleo earned a Pushcart Prize nomination. His latest story collection, entitled Kiss the Scars on the Back of My Neck, will be published by Amble Press soon. And noted author William J. Mann has lauded the collection as a remarkable examination of the human condition. Okonkwo has also served as prose editor for the Newtown Literary, a journal dedicated to nurturing writers from Queens, New York. He's edited Best Gay Stories 2017 and has led creative work, writing workshops at Gotham's Writers Workshop, Newtown, Library, Newtown Literary Queens Library, and the Bronx Council on the Arts. He's also served on the planning committee for the Provincetown Book Festival. Joe is currently working on a new novel called King Gladys. He lives and writes in Queens, New York City. Welcome, Joe. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Saratoga Book Festival for, for having me and for the, uh, the attendees for uh, coming tonight. So I'm going to read a, a selection from a story called Skin. It's the second story in the collection just a little bit of context. Uh, the narrator has just met or recently met uh, a man that he really likes. Uh, they've had one date, it was just a lunch date, and now they're, uh, they're at the, the narrator's house the next day uh, having their second date. My place the next day, Ernie's coming. I'm fixing dinner, baked chicken, fresh asparagus, shrimp. I would normally include rice or pasta, but Ernie has renounced carbs. I gut the shrimp and try to temper my hopes and coax them down from their moon high altitude. This always happens when I meet a guy I like. I get too far ahead of myself too fast. So fast I can't slow the momentum. So fast that when disappointment arrives, I'm unprotected. Wisely or stupidly, I always try again. I hope Ernie is different. I think he will be. I always think that. He's here. We hug as if, you, as if it's been weeks since we last saw each other instead of 23 hours and 26 minutes. I pour wine. He takes a sip then sets his glass on the coffee table like a judge setting down a gavel. I want to read your poetry, he says. This very minute? This very minute. We go to the bedroom and sit at the computer, or rather he sits and I kneel beside him, our arms spiraled around each other's shoulders. His eyebrows crease and uncrease as he reads. When he reaches the end of each poem, he kisses me. As he scrolls through the verses, I think, I'd like to live with this man one day. I put my head on his shoulder, that evolves to caressing and kissing. <clears throat> I thought we'd have dessert after dinner, but I don't like this. Ernie is aggressive, which I like. He maneuvers me to the bed. We undress. I'm horrified at what I see. I expected a slender body, and it is, but with blobs of excess skin budding around his pecs and bubbling his midsection. It streams from his buttocks, droops down his back. The excess skin is wrinkly, loose, devoid of elasticity or tautness. I touch it, 
It's gelatinous and squishy. It pours off his body like lumpy dough poured from a bowl. I didn't expect a ripped body or six pack abs or a high definition chest, but I didn't expect this either. Half rough, half gentle, Ernie propels me onto my back. His hunger heightens each second, but my arousal is withered. To reignite it, I shut my eyes tight, tight, and think about how wonderful he is, how sweet and smart and cute, how he loves books and jazz and my poetry. I squeeze my eyes tighter, as if the strain might reconfigure my sight, redesign my visual perception so that I'll like what I see when I open them again. I reopen them. I see his body. I can't do this. I stop him, take his face in both my hands. I look into his eyes. I'm sorry, I say. Flustered, jarred, breathless, he looks at me as if he doesn't understand. I've interrupted treasure and he can't make sense of why. And then he gets it. His eyes don't shift. His face and body remain still, but a heartsick air creeps up and envelops him. I feel it. If it had a temperature, it would freeze me. He gathers his clothes slowly, dazed, and goes into the bathroom. He closes the door. I hear him crying. The sound is tender, just like the tender man whom I've hurt. I sit on my bed and wait. When he emerges, we don't speak. We head to the front door as if, because there is no other option. I've butchered the possibility so ferociously alive only 40 years, only 40 minutes ago. Our wine glasses, still full, dawdle on the coffee table. The apartment is flush with the odor of baking chicken. The music has changed. Leontine Price singing the aria Visidarte from Tosca and her dusky, opulent soprano. Ernie leaves. Neither of us says goodbye. I'm gonna leave it, leave it at that. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, Michael, why don't you come back and join us? And Joe, are you still here? I'm still here. Oh, I should. Yeah, come on back. There we go. <laughs> there you go. Wow. So both very powerful. Both the imagery is incredible in both of them. You just feel the pain of the characters. You really, really do. Um, I don't know if you guys want to start, if you have any questions for each other, or I can throw something out there um, to, to get things going. Joe, do you mind if I ask you a question? Sure, go ahead. And first, I just, uh, that's such a great reading, and that, that story just sort of slayed me. I mean, the, the ending of that story is one of the, definitely one of the high points of your, your book. It, it, it just, um, you didn't let anybody off the hook, and it's just so painful that he's done what is honest for him but it but he knows that he's created this great hurt to, to a wonderful guy anyway i love that i don't know if, exactly if, how to phrase this but um i'm hoping it will spur you to maybe say something interesting and illuminating to me um one of the other things i really admire about your book is the the range of registers that you write in and i mean one way to talk about it might be code switching, I guess, but I mean, particularly in the final throughout, but, but it, we see it right all together in the final long story with the title story where half of it is written in a voice that I guess we would call, you know, African-American vernacular English, and half of it is, um, and the character is, you know, from, from uh, Queens and has had a sort of a rough upbringing. The other um, part is narrated in sort of highfalutin, very, proper, you know, Queen's English um, with a character who, well, has also had a rough upbringing, but um, has gotten very educated. And, and I also noticed that, you know, um, music is such a huge part of the book and you even have a playlist at the end and you have this range of registers of music as well. You have, you write beautifully about jazz and some fabulous stuff about blues, but then, and then that 
last story, you seem very comfortable talking about opera and you sort of seem to borrow from that register. And I just wondered if you could talk about how, well, first sort of what it's like to write in different registers um, and how that, what, what you intend by playing them off against each other, but also um, how does music play into that? I mean, I almost felt like the different voices are almost like the difference between say blues and maybe even hip hop and opera. And do you think of it that way? And do you use the music to inspire you? I don't know, I'm just curious about how the different things sound to you. Mm -hmm. Well, I used to used to be an actor and I always prided, prided myself on uh, making every character that I played on stage completely different from, from anything else I'd played. So I think I do the same thing with, with writing. I try to, try to embody uh, each, uh, each story uh, uh, with its own, its own vernacular, its own music, its own, its own texture. And music has always been a giant part of my life. Uh, jazz and opera primarily, but also more contemporary music. Um, so I guess when I'm, when I'm writing, I'm trying, I also, I use music to also to, uh, not just to set a mood, but also to, to establish a historical period. Um, so many of, the, some of the stories take place in other historical periods, either from decades ago or just, a, or just a, or more recently than that. So I, I use music to establish the, time period um, in terms of when there's a short story collection by Juno Diaz called Drown and I read maybe half of it and one reason I didn't read the other half of it is that I felt like I was reading the same story again and again the characters were all kind of similar all kind of similar situations and, and and I just I didn't feel like reading the same story again and again. So I think that's again one thing I'm striving for: make every story uh, a completely different world and a completely different experience. I think that's it's interesting because I I mean I I try to do the same thing in in my book: lots of different kinds of characters and situations and even time periods. And I, I sort of share your view of that. But I, I think in the publishing world, it, they you know there's everybody wants um, consistent narrative. So they, they often try to sort of cheat story collections and call them a novel in stories or, or take, or take a disparate stories and then sort of turn all the narrators into the same narrator. I think people think that's more marketable, um, but I'm, I'm with you. I like a, a variety. I mean, yeah, maybe more marketable. Maybe that's why I had so much trouble finding a publisher. <laughs> So I have a, a question uh, for you. Uh, yeah, there's some of, some of the stories um, in your collection deal with topics or characters that are that are forbidden. I mean, for instance, uh, Uncle Kent, which for me I think was my was my, my favorite story. I, mean, I, I don't want to give away the, any, any spoilers, but Uncle Kent has some uh, attractions that wouldn't be considered proper. And then there's the story Marge, and everything about Marge is, is forbidden. And then there's, there's the story about the priest, you know, the very kind of virile, attractive young priest, and it's implied that he could possibly uh, cheat on his, his vows of celibacy. So I'm curious about your, uh, you seem to have an attraction maybe to, to writing about the forbidden. So if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I really appreciate that question. And actually, I mean, I, um, I would say the same about uh, you and, and your work. I really noticed that, that you, you go to some, I mean, even in this, the excerpt you just read, but in other stories as well, I think you sort of embrace taboos. And I love that you give an unsanitized view of certain worlds that often feel like when they're presented, they are certain certain tough topics are scrubbed out of them. So I really I love that about about your work. I mean, I wish I could say I had some some grand theory about why I do it. I think it's just how my screwed up mind works. Is that the things that I'm drawn to and that I think about and that I dream up when I'm you know sitting alone in my room 
are these sort of um, yeah, these topics that other people think are unspeakable or <laughs> or whatever. But it's just what I'm trying to work out in my own mind, and I often think of of those uh, situations that that are really sort of itchy, um, and um, yeah, and I try to um, when I feel sort of scared of going somewhere in the writing, I try to take the advice that I'm always giving my students and I'm usually bad at taking my own advice. I'm, it's much easier to give advice than to, to take it. But I, you know, I always say write towards your fear. Um, and, if, and, and if you're not feeling sort of scared and uncomfortable about what you're writing, you're probably not on the, the right path. So that I do have sort of like a little meter in my mind as I'm writing, you know, like if it gets closer to something really hot, I'm like, okay, good, keep going that way. And if it's a little bit more ho-hum, you know, then I, then I, 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 I try to recalibrate. Um, so, yeah, and I think, um, I don't know, I just, I, I, I take inspiration from a lot of writers in the past who've done the same thing, and particularly queer writers who, who really, when, when almost anything queer what would have been, you know, been sort of taboo and unspeakable, who, who just who went there. And they, those books are so important to me when I was coming up that, that um, yeah, I take inspiration from that, I guess I would say. Uh, Edwidge Dondekat, a uh, great writer, she says, um, if I get the quote right, write dangerously for people who like to read dangerously. I take inspiration from that. Great. So I, I have a question for both of you, um, if I if I may jump in. I, I'm curious um, because you're both novelists and you've both released books of short stories, and I'm sort of curious about the process and and how do you know when you have fodder for a short story versus a novel and. And how do you sort of come up with that balance and you know what drives something to be a short story versus something to be part of a, a bigger story. And I don't know, maybe if, if you want to sort of talk about that process a little bit, um, either want to go first. Mike, I'm not, sorry, Joe, go ahead. I'm, I don't know, I think you just kind of know. <laughs> right. uh, Octavia Butler, uh, the great sci-fi novelist said that she hated writing short stories because most of her short stories are really just uh, short stories trying to, or not, uh, they were novels trying to be short stories, but every now and again, she would get it right, which she felt that she was a novelist at heart. Um, I, I think it's just something, in, for me personally, it's just something in my gut. I just, I, I know if this is more of a short story. I guess if I, a, a short story is more of a slice, a slice of cake as opposed to an entire cake with layers and frosting and so if if something feels like a slice then it should be a short story and if it feels like it's an entire cake then then it becomes a novel i i feel the same way and i've um i know other writers have you know written a story and then they expand it into a novel for example and i've never had anything that felt like that it could even do that in, in my own mind. In fact, I had a editor once, um, I published a short story and he, he said, if I expanded it into a novel, he would publish it as a novel. And I, I said, well, but sorry, the story ended. I mean, it, 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 I wrote it and it has an end. I can't, I can't figure out how to do it. Um, and for me, I guess it's just about the scope of the questions is maybe how I'd say it. So, if 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 I feel like sort of one major question, then I find the narrative situation to to get at that question, and it's a short story. But if it's a question that leads to another question, that leads to another question, then to me it, it feels like a novel. So I I'm sort of with Octavia Butler a little bit in that I um, stories drive me crazy a little bit because they they take as much prep work you still have to invent the whole world you know you have to imagine the characters i mean all that upfront work is is about equivalent but then all you get out of it is a short story <laughs> <You know? laughs> 
So we, ha we have a, a question from one of our participants here. So Kim Van Alcamada, who is one of our curators and um, a, a local author and a friend here in Saratoga Springs asks, um, is the research and writing process different for you when you set a story in the historical past or in the contemporary present? So I'll just throw a hint out there. Kim writes historical novels. So um, I'm, I'm sure she has a, a sort of thought on this. But. Kim's historical novels are beautiful and beautifully researched and um, flawlessly researched. Um, I guess, I mean, I'll be curious what Joe says because his range is, is really big. I mean, when I, my, um, the one historical novel I wrote set in 1917, 1918, just sort of overwhelmed me with the, the research because it was a period that I knew nothing whatsoever about. So even to figure out, you know, the character got up in the morning and if she had to put on her shoes, I had to figure out what kind of shoes they would wear and how they tied their shoes. And, and if she had to walk across the room, I had to figure out what kind of rooms they lived in and how much was rent. And, uh, you know, I would say like, how much is rent a month? But actually they would have paid by the week then. So that's the kind of thing you, you, know, you find out in your, your research. I think the process is, is not all that different for me if I'm writing it more in the recent past. It's just the, 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 the extent or the volume. You know? So if, it's, if I'm writing something said in, say, 1993, the story excerpt that I just read, you know, I lived through that. I was roughly the same age as the character then. So you know, I, the character gets in a car and he drives to, from Boston to Portland. And I know the road he would take and I knew the kinds of cars that he would have available. But there's... Um, you know, I, I think the we try to hide um, some of the research and make it seem like we know everything. So like in that case, for example, um, a lot of it is very closely based on a dear friend and mentor of mine who did die of AIDS and who I did help take care of. But, you know, for example, all the medical details in what I just read about heparin and the catheter and all that kind of stuff actually were not at all part of the, my caring for him. He didn't have a catheter and he didn't, so he didn't have heparin and whatever, but I, I had to research certain kind. You know, I, I I wanted more of a medical scene, and so I spent you know a lot of time researching trying to get those details right. And I, I'm sure Joe, you have the same thing. But you know, it's like you can spend like an eight-hour day doing that research, and it ends up being one or two sentences in the piece that just give you just a little see a feeling of authority or authenticity. So that's for me anyway. Yeah, I think same same here. Um, when I was researching my novel, uh, writing my novel Jazz Moon, my debut novel, uh, I had a scene in a in a locker room. Uh, with these hotel workers in in their you know, changing room, and I had a scene uh, part of the scene that they 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 open a locker, and I thought, wait a minute, it's, this novel takes place in 1925, and I thought, wait, did did they have lockers in 1925? <laughs> And so I did, you know, did some quick research, and yes, indeed, they they had lockers in 1925 that look uh, are very similar to our lockers today. But it's yeah, it's those tiny little details that can that can make or break a story. And if you can get the details right and and get them across with, like you just said, Michael, with some authority, I think it makes it a, a better experience. For the for the for the reader, it really helps to to build that world uh, that that you're trying to immerse them in, and it also uh, I think the more the more details, the more research, and the more details, the more the, the more the reader will trust you. Uh, I just finished rereading uh, the the Danish Girl by David Ebershoff. Really wonderful novel and it's a little intimidating because every single paragraph is just packed with you know little details and I think how did he how did he know that how did he find that writing a novel now based uh, uh, take, that takes place in the 1920s and it, it's the research is it's intimidating it's um, uh, the first part of it takes place in Philadelphia I think early 1900s between 1907 and 1923, and I mean I don't I don't know anything about Philadelphia in that in that during that era, and I, I'm kind of struggling with that uh, to be perfectly honest, 
because I want those, I want, I don't want generalities. I want the specifics. I want to know, you know, the, the route of the streetcar and what the houses would have looked like and how much they would have paid for this or that or how much they would have earned you know, uh, at this or that job. Um, and like you said, you do all that research, you know, eight hours of research for, for a couple of sentences, but, but it's worth it. I was just going to say, it's funny you say you want to know the route of the streetcar. When I was researching my novel, Charity Girl, the, the historical one, one of my, and this was before Google and all that, it was a lot harder, which I know David, uh, who wrote The Danish Girl, also faced, he, you know, he wrote all that pretty much before we, we had all the internet stuff. But one of the great finds I had for that was a little book that was um, for like the 1917 New England Hardware Dealers Annual Meeting. And they, when they came to Boston and when you checked in for that meeting, the Hardware Dealers Association, whatever, gave each of the participants this little book, which was sort of like a little guide to Boston and it had streetcar maps and everything. And it was just uh, okay. a gold mine. I just stole everything from it, you know. I, I, I love that kind of stuff. Um, and um, I mean, the, the other thing, I, maybe you can find some of this for Philadelphia. I loved finding um, first person uh, memoirs and novels and stuff published at the time. And then you, you pick up just the, the rhythms of the speech and stuff like that. And even that can be um, as good as a particular detail um, I found. Right. And thank, thank God for the internet. I don't think I'd be able to write a historical novel if it wasn't, wasn't for the internet. So, so um, do we have time for a little more reading? I, I think we'd love to hear from you if you have a little more in you. Um, Joe, do you want to jump in this time and give us sure. a snippet of something? So this is uh, from a piece called You Can't Do That to Gladys Bentley. Um, Gladys, some, some context, Gladys Bentley was a blues singer and pianist and uh, uh, Harlem Renaissance uh, icon during the 1920s and 30s. And she was also openly lesbian. And she claimed at one, she claimed to have married uh, a white woman in, a, in an Atlantic City uh, civil uh, uh, ma marriage ceremony. And she also dressed like a man, both in her private life and on stage, and uh, so this this scene is uh, takes place with her in a and when she's performing in a nightclub called the Clam House. Gladys's fingers hopscotched across the piano keys, smashing out notes dunked in blues and dripping rhythm. It was her first song and her first set of the night. Her eyes hadn't yet adjusted to the dark club the stage lights blinding glare. She couldn't see a thing outside the stage but her explosive smile blazed as she winked and waved and nodded at folks in the crowd like she could see every face. They were too drunk to know any better. Eight years into this craze called prohibition and folks still acted like Saturday night was a bountiful Christmas with the ever flowing, overflowing gift of bootleg liquor especially at clubs like the Clam House where Gladys Bentley reigned, enthroned at the piano, moaning raunchy, sophisticated, bluesy jazz and jazzy blues from 10 p.m. till dawn. Her clothes were as sophisticated as her music. No gowns or feathers or horsehair wigs for her. No, sir. Gladys manned it up, all 250 pounds of her in sparkling white tucks and tails, white shoes and white shirt and bow tie, all of it crowned with a tall cock angled top hat. Elegant white, dressing elegant brown. She was dapper, dashing, debonair. At heart, Gladys Alberta Bentley was a gentleman. Her backup band pumped and bumped, ornamenting Gladys, Gladys's piano, lifting it till the melody soared. Gladys moaned out some lyrics. My brown bowl's full of berries. They're so ripe and juicy sweet. My brown bowl's full of berries. They're so ripe and juicy sweet. 
I stick my fingers in my berries. The juice knocks me off my feet. Someone licked my juicy berries. Lord, child, I had a fit. Someone licked my juicy berries. Lord, child, I had a fit. When they said, I'll stop it, Gladys, I said, please, oh, please don't quit. Her eyes had adjusted now. The clam house was packed, a cacophony of color, whites up from downtown and Negroes down from Strivers Row and Sugar Hill men in suits and tuxes and chicks in flapper dresses with long strands of fringe dra dr drizzling off every inch. Negroes and whites mixed it up, drinking and breaking bread at the same tables. A Negro man fed broiled shrimp to a white woman, forking it into her buoyant mouth like feeding a child. A giddy group of Negroes and whites made toast upon toast with flutes of champagne like it was New Year's Eve. White jacketed black bow tied waiters cavorted through the narrow spaces between tables, noses high in the air, backside swinging, one hand carrying a tray, the other perched on a haughty hip. A pair of white queer men on the east side of the room caressed each other's hands. On the west side, a colored pair locked lips. A mixed pair frolicked at a table in the middle, white guy on colored guy's lap colored guy's fingers sunk in his boyfriend's mouth. Mannish women, bull daggers, white and colored, cut loose in suits and ties. Their hair straightened, short cropped, slicked back, arms tossed around the backs of their chairs, legs spread as wide as an invitation. Negro drag queens and white drag queens held court in breathtaking regalia, made up like movie stars, styled wigs glistening, and those girls' gowns were more chic than anything on Fifth Avenue. The queen's curvaceous legs were crossed at the knee and swinging to the pulse of Gladys's piano. The Clam House, a rollicking black-white island oasis set back from a brutal mainland. It was protected, oh so thinly, by the inhabitants' madness for sex, their craving to cross boundaries, and their determination to desecrate taboos, and all of it galvanized by the, in, by the inhibition lowering magic of bootleg liquor. <laughs> the place was packed all right. Every eye was glued to Miss Gladys Bentley. Of course, how could they not be glued to a 250 pound colored bull dagger smashing out blues? The spotlight made her smolder like a beacon in her all white getup as she dished out body blues. Got a deep hole in my floor. Come on, baby, don't you tease. Got a deep hole in my floor. Come on, baby, don't you tease. My hole is sweet and muddy. Come on, baby, fill it, please. It was one of her naughtier songs, and that was saying something. The kind of Gladys Bentley tune that had got the clam house raided in the past and would again. Gladys scanned the crowd. A couple of Negro stuff shirts walked out, snooty faces painted with disgust. Good, Gladys thought, means I've done my job. And she'd done her job when the queers hurled their heads so far back with laughter, their chairs nearly tipped over. And when the drag queens nodded their royal heads, Gladys sat up a little straighter on that piano bench, proud to have earned their sage approval. Most of the white folks reacted like white folks usually did, squealing like brats electrified by a delightful terror in a Halloween haunted house. It's why they flocked to the clam house why they braved their way to Harlem, to be scandalized by the antics of wild and exotic Negroes. It was Gladys's duty to give them what they came for. It was her pleasure to provoke, offend, shake shit up, antagonize the stuffed shirts, challenge the highbrows who thought they'd seen and heard it all, disrespectfully let them know that there was no such thing. 
If you're good to me, baby, you can slide down my muddy hole. If you're good to me, baby, you can slide down my muddy hole. So stop clowning, baby. Come send Gladys to her soul. She pummeled the piano in an extended interlude, a transformation from body blues to rip roaring swing, from tongue in cheek irreverence to jazz combustion. Gladys closed her eyes, whirled in the music, got fucking lost in it. Thanks. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Joe, I just have to ask you, are those uh, actual lyrics from her and from then, or did you write those lyrics? I wrote them. I, I Googled and I couldn't find them. Those are such <laughs> fucking amazing lyrics. I can't even begin. I just, they're just so good. Thank you. They're, they're modeled after uh, uh, actual blues. There were a lot of blues, uh, blues, blues singing ladies in the 20s who sang raunchy yeah. double entendre uh, songs. Like people like Bessie Smith and Ma Rainey were sure. very famous for that. Yeah, I love those. And it's my highest compliment I can pay you that I Googled. Try to find, to try to find those <laughs> lyrics. Awesome. Um, well, I'll read from another story. And I was thinking, you know, Joe was asking about sort of writing about this ta taboo topics or whatever. I, I think I realized that what I what I mostly end up writing about over and over is people who think of themselves as good people and then do things or think things or flirt with attractions or whatever that make them challenge their own story about themselves that they tell themselves. So this is one of the stories that's a little bit about that, although the, the part that really gets to that is, is you know, I'm not gonna be able to read, I'll just read the beginning part of it. Um, uh, and it is called um, Thieves. There were two of them sting at me from the murk beneath a palm tree along the jungly trail that twisted off to the shanty town. In grubby board shorts, shirtless, the slim one sat with a towel around his shoulders. The burly one stood behind brandishing cordless clippers and buzzed his friend's blackish hair with tender brutality. Even from 30 feet away out on the white sand lane, I could sense the fresh crew cuts effect. His head looked newborn, true, a blank slate. Oi, he beckoned, oi, broader. He used the English word, but Brazilianized, broader. I glimpsed his waving arm, its skinny animation, but not his face, not in any detail. The sky was starting to blur with dusk, and of the scarce street lamps along this shortcut between the combi stop and our surfside guest house, only one gave out any light. I'd watched boys all over the island using such lamps as targets, pelting them with beer bottles and rotting coconuts. When the bulbs burst, the hooligans cheered, goal. But this kid and his roughneck pal were older, 18, 19. Brother, the slim one called again, his voice sharp with nerve. Then he added in Portuguese, please, we just wanna use your cell phone. This was my third trip to Bahia after projects in Sao Tome and Mozambique, and I could handle basic conversations in the language. Sorry, I said, don't have one. I didn't break my stride. Liar, yelled the tough with the clippers, squaring his brawny shoulders. How stupid do you think we are? Liar. A stunted mutt, scared by the shout, bolted from the bushes, but just as soon forgot its fear and fervently stole some fish bones from an overflowing wire cage of trash. Sure, I have a phone, I said, not with me. Seriously, said the lean kid, goadingly rubbing his crew cut. I thought a gringo always has his iPhone. Another 200 yards and I'd be safe at the folksy guest house with its hammock, its icy caipirinhas. I'd suffered a sticky, mosquito-addled day in a boondocks village, dickering with farmers about a loan for their hearts of palm plantation. But now this cheeky crew-cut punk, his brazen heckle, gringo, had severed the last thread of my politeness. 
carry my phone here, I said, where I might meet a thief. Thief was one of the first words my Portuguese coach had taught me, a satisfying nasal sneer, ladrão. He stood up slowly, smiling, shaking out his towel. Theatrically, he snapped it, and the world at once was weaponized. Towel, clippers, fists. Wagner, the guest house owner, had warned me about the shanty town. Why are you alone, said the kid, sauntering halfway toward me. He swept clipped hairs from the hollow of his scrawny, meatless chest. Just this easily, he seemed to say, I could dispense with you. I looked ahead, behind, no one on the lane. The only building, a shuttered vacation home from the island's boom days, sat dark behind its wall of concrete studded with jagged glass. Why, he repeated, where is your sexy wife? You don't know me, I said, ready to sprint. Leave me alone. No, no, your wife, he said, and staged a vulgar pantomime, swinging his hips, hefting imagined tits. Where is she today? Where is Marisa? I stopped short. How do you know her name? Tell me. How? He didn't flinch. He laughed. Now you defend her? Good, he said. Not like yesterday, arguing with her. Stop, Marisa, Marisa, please. He sang the words in lilting, malformed English. The gossipy little tune sapped some of his menace. What had Marisa and I been sparring about the day before? She'd been over praising my tact with the local land agent and I'd been trying to tamp down her sweet talk. She's not my wife, I said, guessing he meant no harm. She's just my, what was the word for coworker? What was it? My friend. Oh, a friend. Nice, he said. Friends can be more fun. He grabbed his crotch and, giving a low grunt, stirred it. Now I was laughing at the pureness of his swagger and at his conviction that I, at 38, balding, plain-faced, was sleeping with a looker like Marisa, or with any woman for that matter. I found it, <clears throat> found his cocksure act impairingly seductive. Today she didn't come, I offered. Sick, you know, her stomach. Aye, the gringo's always sick, he said. They want so much to taste our island life, but the gut says no. And you, your stomach is hard and strong? Me? Oh, yes, I patted my paunch. The stomach of a bayanu. He nodded warmly, clearly amused I'd called myself a local. He didn't need to know about the prophylactic Cipro I'd been taking twice a day since I arrived the script written by Craig, my internist husband. The burly kid approached now, too, revealing his darker face, his broody brow. He paused to squint judgmentally, then sprang forward, bellowing something. I stiffened, stumbled back. On he barreled with bullish, galumphing charm, his cheeks dimpling. Come, he was saying, forget the cell phone, have some coconut. The water is good for you, makes you healthy. Even now that I got his words, I felt a little shaky. No, I told him I had to go. I should see if Marisa had improved. Later, he said dismissively, you must live. He opened his arms invitingly like someone in a travel ad. The lane was still deserted. Even the dog had fled. My sped up breaths infused me with a tingle of remoteness. I stood there in the dimming light letting the island's evening soundtrack throb against my skin, the hymns of frogs, the sly swish of monkeys in the mango trees. From down the lane, the sea's endless applause. Maybe the gringo is just too something, the kid with the crew cut said, using a word I couldn't recognize. Yes, I think, said the bigger one, too something, to be with boys from the street like us. No, I said, come on, how can you say that? Well, he said, then, so? The day's heat had dissolved into a briny, pricking breeze. The air itself seemed to egg me on. I guess, I said, I guess, okay, and started down the path. And I hope it gets more intriguing from there. <laughs> That's where I'll stop. Well, it certainly does. 
I can say. Um, so we're we're near out of time here, and I, I wish we could go on forever. I have a whole list of questions I would love to ask you guys, but I'll just end with one quick one for each of you. What's next? What what are you working on? I know we mentioned Joe, um, the novel you're working on. Maybe you can give us a little glimpse. Just tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. Well, the piece I just read about Lattice Bentley, that's that's the next novel. Uh, in fact, this story was uh, kind of a, a test run uh, in preparation to write the novel. Um, so that's that's my next my next uh, my current project. It's awesome. called uh, King Gladys. Awesome. We can't wait. Yes, can't wait. Can't wait. Um, I've been working all on nonfiction uh, lately on on uh, essays, sort of me short memoir essays that I hope we'll, I'll pull together as a, a collection with a sort of a novel length, a novella length um, essay piece, mm. sort of anchoring it and some other shorter ones, some of which um, I get into similar itchy territory that Joe was talking about, but now it's all the more uh, uncomfortable for me because the they're true and the narrator is myself so i've got to figure out how i'm gonna if i can eventually get it published figure out how i'm going to explain that to my parents <laughs> as we'll have to see <laughs> awesome well I, I cannot thank you guys enough for coming and giving us a glimpse into these worlds that you've created i think um i i truly enjoyed both of your books and and look forward to more from each of you um, and thank you to the folks who are here tonight and of course, Saratoga Pride and Saratoga Book Festival. And we'll look forward to keeping in touch, I hope. And maybe, you know, maybe we'll find a way to have you come out to Saratoga someday and, and be part of all of this. So love to do that. That would be great. Thanks, Steve. And thanks, Joe. It was great. It was an honor reading with you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.